China Current is a weekly news talk show from China to the world. We cover viral news about China every week and also give you the newest updates on China's cutting edge technologies. Let's get started. Welcome to China Current, your weekly news report on the latest developments in China. I'm Chris. And in this episode, China's breakthrough on treating cancers. China sends rescue teams to Myanmar. And Chinese Foreign Minister visits Russia. First, let's see how China found a new therapy to kill cancers. On March 29th, according to Chinese media Itai, China became the world leader in the number of original drugs entering clinical trials over the past 10 years, surpassing the United States. A statistical report by Tsinghua University and the Next Pharma database revealed that in 2024, China developed 704 new drugs. That's 264 more than the United States, accounting for 38% of the global total. Notably, Chinese research not only leads in quantity, but also boldly tackles the most challenging task, treating cancer. On January 22nd, Professor Zhao Yixiang's team from Guangxi Medical University published a new anti-cancer method on cell. They conducted extensive experiments on monkeys, successfully extending the survival time of those with late-stage cancer by more than 50%. In subsequent clinical trials, 20 patients with late-stage drug-resistant cancer received full therapy, and these patients separately suffer from liver, ovarian, colon, lung, breast, esophageal, melanoma, and cervical cancers. And in 90% of the cases, tumors shrank or stopped growing. No severe adverse reactions or significant neutralizing antibody responses were observed, demonstrating the safety of the approach. So how did Professor Zhao achieve this? The therapy, known scientifically as oncolytic virus therapy, essentially works by turning tumor cells into pigs. Tumors are notoriously difficult to treat because they can disguise themselves as healthy cells, deceiving the immune system. Professor Zhao integrated the gene encoding a pig cell porcine into Newcastle disease virus, that's NDV, constructing the recombinant oncolytic virus, NDV-GT, that selectively infects cancer cells. Once infected, these cancer cells begin to produce an enzyme typically found only in pigs. To the human immune system, it appears as if pork is circulating in the bloodstream, prompting the immune system to mobilize and clear the abnormal cells from healthy tissues swiftly. In this way, by disrupting the camouflage of cancer cells, the immune system effectively controls the disease in late-stage patients. Remarkably, one patient even experienced complete remission. Essentially, this approach induces a deliberately engineered hyperacute rejection. While hyperacute rejection is a fatal complication in organ transplantation, Professor Zhao has ingeniously harnessed it as a key to combat cancer. In addition to its impressive efficacy, Professor Zhao's discovery holds significant implications for the global south. The NDV was originally a strain of avian influenza virus that once wreaked havoc in Britain. However, when humans are infected with it, most cases are asymptomatic, with only a few individuals experiencing mild fever or flu-like symptoms. This characteristic makes NDV an ideal vaccine vector. By disguising NDV as another virus, the human immune system can learn to recognize these viruses under relatively mild conditions and produce the corresponding antibodies. Before China used it to treat cancer, other countries also used it to make vaccines for Ebola and COVID-19. According to the New York Times, in 2021, Professor Peter Palis developed a novel coronavirus vaccine called NDV-HXPS. Because NDV is inherently highly transmissible among poultry, the production of these vaccines primarily relies on inexpensive eggs rather than costly raw materials and sophisticated equipment required for RNA vaccines like those from Moderna. As a result, countries such as Brazil, Vietnam, Thailand, and Mexico have achieved complete independent production. Thailand's health minister said, this vaccine production is produced by Thai people for Thai people. Ms. Taylor of the Duke Global Health Innovation Center was sympathetic. I could understand why that would really be such an attractive prospect. They've been at the mercy of global supply chains. For many years, big pharma companies in the United States and Europe have monopolized the research, manufacturing, and sales of anti-cancer drugs. Now the work of Professor Zhao Yongxiang and numerous other Chinese experts not only breaks that monopoly, 
but may also pave the way for Global South to establish its own production lines for anti-cancer drugs. Next up, China is also saving lives in Myanmar. On March 28, a powerful magnitude 7.9 earthquake struck Myanmar, triggering an immediate international response. Within just 18 hours, the Chinese medical team from Yunnan province arrived in the affected region, becoming the first international rescue group on the ground. By March 30th, a 118-member China international rescue team comprising earthquake specialists, engineers, medical personnel, and rescue dogs had landed at Myanmar's airport. The following day, the first batch of China's $30 million humanitarian aid package was dispatched, including 1,200 tents, 8,000 blankets, and over 40,000 first aid kits, all delivered via chartered aircraft. China also pledged additional emergency supplies, such as drinking water and ready-to-eat meals. According to the Chinese Foreign Ministry, as of March 31st, over 400 Chinese rescue experts and medical workers were actively participating in relief efforts. On the other hand, Trump promised aid to Myanmar either. But in the same day, he also announced plans to cut nearly all remaining jobs at USAID and effectively shut down the agency. Sarah Charles, a former senior USAID official, told Reuters, I suspect we will see very shortly Chinese teams showing up if they haven't already, possibly Turkish, Russian, Indian teams really making their presence known in support of people that are really suffering right now in Thailand and Myanmar. And the U.S. won't be there. Uh, moving on, on April 2nd, China's Foreign Minister Wang Yi concluded a three-day official visit to Russia. Just on March 27th, Russian Deputy Prime Minister Alexei Overchuk spoke at China's Boao Forum for Asia. He stated that China and Russia are exploring ways of how to cooperate and work together to improve the living standard of people in both countries. In fact, one major area of cooperation is energy. Back in December last year, the China-Russia East Route natural gas pipeline was completed in full. Stretching over 5,000 kilometers, it transports natural gas from Siberia all the way to Shanghai. According to Chinese state media, the pipeline can deliver up to 38 billion cubic meters of gas to China each year, enough to supply 130 million households annually. As of February, the pipeline had already delivered over 90 billion cubic meters of gas to China, boosting China's energy security. And it's not just China benefiting from this pipeline. China is the world's largest importer of natural gas. According to Russia's Sputnik News, Alexei Grivach, deputy director of the National Energy Security Fund, said that since Russia began piping gas to China in 2019, it has earned more than $18 billion from the exports. With the pipeline now fully operational, Russia is expected to earn between $8 billion and $10 billion annually from gas sales to China starting from 2025. That's all for today. Thank you for watching this episode of China Currents. If you have any thoughts or comments, please leave it below. See you next time.